Okay, right, this was supposed to be one video, but I have opened a massive can of worms with this. In about 2014, I wrote a blog post about drivetrain efficiency and the products that were on the market at the time, and I discovered a company called Friction Facts, which I used to base all of my evidence on. I decided to do a video updating this, and of course, in the intervening years, loads of things have changed. For example, Friction Facts has been bought out by Ceramic Speed, and Jason Smith, who founded Friction Facts, now works for Ceramic Speed. So therefore, all of that independent research that was there is now slightly more biased. However, I'll come back onto that a little bit more in the future. Because of the massive topic that this has become, this has now become three videos. I contacted a guy in Australia called Adam Kerrin, who runs a company called Zero Friction, because he's now an independent tester. Now he tests in a slightly different way to what Jason Smith used to do at Friction Facts. Friction Facts was about trying to find the fastest items. Adam Kerrin's remit is about trying to find something that will last a long time, about its longevity. Before I go deeper into these videos, I just want to extend a massive thank you to Adam Kerrin for his huge amount of help on me making these videos. I dropped him an email two days ago and my mind was completely blown by some of the insights that he gave me, some of the research and the science that he was helping me try and understand. His, his idea of what being independent is and how big companies are kind of shady about their marketing at times. And he also let me into some privy and pretty off the record stuff that has completely blown my mind and made me think about this whole thing in a different way. Hence why we're now gonna get three videos out of this. So where can we start with now what seems to be a massive topic? Well, I'm gonna make three videos, and this one is gonna be about what I consider to be the Gibbons. There may not be any new information on this for most of you, but I've done a huge amount of reading and a huge amount of research, and I've tried not to be swayed by any marketing, and I've arrived at three main principles about getting the most efficient drive chain you can. The second video I'm gonna make is about the specifics about how I go about things and the things that I'm using, and it may give you a few ideas, but again, this is all based off of the, the, the huge amount of research that I've been doing in this over the last week or so. And then finally, in the last video, I wanna look a bit deeper at some of the marketing that people put into these things because it is big business and it can be a little bit kind of disconcerting to know exactly what to do when one company's making one claim and another company's making another claim. And that's gonna be the third video. So let's get on to what I consider to be the givens of drive chain efficiency. What we're talking about here are the three key components of making sure that what you're doing is as optimized as it possibly could be. Let's start off what, by what we mean by drive chain efficiency. Now, over the last couple of months, Ceramic Speed have been putting quite a lot of marketing into their new speed drive system, which they claim to be 99% efficient. Now that claim of 99% efficiency isn't something that I can call into question. I don't have the science or research for that, but it did make me start thinking about just how efficient our drive chains are anyway. So links to all of the research and all of the papers and everything that I could find are all linked in the, in the comments below. And from what I could discover from the research that in the range of wattages that we're gonna be riding at, so for most of us between 200 and 300 watts, our drive chain isn't that inefficient as it stands anyway, as long as it's optimized it's about 96 to 98% efficient. So we're not gonna be gaining 15, 20, 50, 100 watts out of this, but we are gonna be gaining something out of it, i.e. I can't say exactly how many watts we're gonna get because that is a really dangerous ground to go on. If you watch any videos on YouTube where people claim two, three, 6.8 watts or anything like that, they get torn to shreds, and I think possibly rightly so. But the way that I see these things are, if I do these things, are they gonna make me slower? The fact is no, absolutely they won't. Will they make me faster? Yes. Is it quantifiable? No, ultimately it's not. But it's not gonna be a waste of time doing it. Am I gonna be spending three hours and maybe 150 pounds on gaining 0.3 of a watt? Or could it be six watts? Who knows, who really knows? But what I do know is that I'm not gonna lose three or four or 20 or 50 watts by doing what I'm doing. I'm definitely gonna gain, whether it's 0.1 of a watt or whether it's 10 watts. So when we say an optimized drive chain is 96 to 98% efficient as it stands at the moment, what do we actually mean by an optimized drive chain? Well, that's where the three kind of givens as far as I'm concerned come into it. And here are the three main tenets for it as far as I'm concerned. One, it needs to be clean. Two, it needs to be lubed. And three, it needs to be bigger. Stop sniggering at the back. So let's take a look at part one making it clean. So this might be one of the kind of chain reservoirs that you're using to clean your chain at the minute. As you can tell from this, I certainly have been for a little while. But according to Adam Kerrin from Zero Friction, to really get your chain clean using one of those, you're gonna to need to spend quite a lot of time running it through it and probably have to change the reservoir of water about 50 times. There is a much simpler and might sound more complicated way of doing this, but I assure you, it's something I've been doing for years and is actually dead straightforward. 
I'm gonna go into detail about how to do this in the next video, but ultimately, you clean your chain in white spirit and you decontaminate it using methylated spirit, and hey presto, you've got a sparkling stripped chain that you can then lube well. I also use an ultrasonic cleaner, but it's absolutely not necessary to have to use this at all. You can do it just using a jam jar and some basic mineral elements and some methylated spirit. Part two, looking at the lube of the chain. Now this is where the can of worms gets opened and we can start looking at all sorts of different proprietary companies that make all sorts of lubes and make all sorts of claims. Back before Ceramic Speed took over Friction Facts, Jason Smith did a huge amount of research into over 50 different proprietary lubricants for our chains and he found a huge amount of results. Again, I'll put a link to it below. One of the things he put on the chains was the paraffin wax that us time trialists in the UK have been using for quite a while and it's kind of been, become a bit of an old wives tale. So he tested this with paraffin wax on and found it to be far superior to any of the other lubes that he made. So having discovered this, he added a few additives to it and kind of perfected a really, really high level of chain wax, started putting them on his own chains and selling them independently. And it was this business that Ceramic Speed bought and Jason went on to start working for them. Now I use a, a wax on my chain and I have done for years and I'm gonna show you how I wax my chain in the next video. But not all of you are gonna to want to destroy a slow cooker so there are some proprietary waxes out there that we call drip lubes that you can use. Now, one of the decent drip lubes that Jason Smith found when he was still at Friction Packs was something called Squirt. And Adam Kerrin, in his research of the longevity of chains, discovered that Silka NFS is a really efficient chain lube. Either of those, if you want to rely on a drip lube, are gonna work for you, Silka NFS, or squirt. Pretty sure I said to stop sniggering at the back. And again, of course, you'll find Adam's research below. One of the things I really like about Adam's research is that he runs his chains clean when he's testing them, but he also tests them wet. And in the UK, obviously, we ride in the wet a lot. And he also contaminates the chains and tests them for contamination as well to see how, how effective they are. Again, like I said, the research is below in the description. So what do I mean for the third part when I say make it bigger? Well, what I'm talking about here is that you will have noticed the likes of Wiggins and Tony Martin in their time trialing using bigger chain rings. Now, of course, we would start thinking that's because they're stronger than us, but actually there are two things at play with this. Bigger chain rings along with bigger jockey wheels allow for less chain ar articulation. So chain articulation is simply as it says, how much the chain actually moves as it's going through. Now, obviously if you're putting it through a small cog, that's gonna articulate a whole lot more than if you're putting it through a big chain ring. So if we take a 4810 gear, for example, 48 on the front and a 10 on the back, and we compare that to a 5311, so 53 on the front and 11 on the back, those are actually pretty similar gear lengths. However, there's gonna be less articulation in the 5311 because those cogs are bigger. So that's one reason to start using oversized jockey wheels and bigger chain rings. Alongside that, we also get chain line. So obviously if we can ride in a bigger chain ring, it's gonna mean that rather than having to ride in the 11 tooth on the back, it's gonna allow us to probably ride in a 12 or a 13 instead. So that's gonna mean our chain line is gonna be more straight through the center of the bike, therefore putting less lateral stress on the chain. Those two are pretty simple efficiencies to kind of gain. So by making it bigger, you're getting less chain articulation, therefore less friction, and you're also getting a better chain line. So there we are, there's the three givens as far as I'm concerned at the minute before we get into this murky world of what is the best lube. So just to recap and summarize very quickly, one, keep it clean. So to clean your chain, use some white spirit and get that completely clean before you start using methylated spirit on it to completely strip it of any decontaminants. Make sure you dispose of those items properly. Once you've got that clean chain, you can either wax it using a paraffin wax, or if you want to use a drip lube, use either Squirt or Silker NFS. And then thirdly, if you want to keep the chain line as straight as you possibly can and cut down on chain arti articulation, then use the biggest cogs you can possibly find. So in the next video, I'm gonna go through what I'm doing to kind of try and optimize these things as best I can without spending an absolute fortune. Be interested to know what your thoughts are on it. As much as I've done a huge amount of research on this, I don't claim to be an expert on it, which is why I contacted Andy Kerrin. He's given me some great insights, but I'd be really keen to know what your thoughts are below. So please drop a message in the comments and I'll, I'll bear that in mind. I'm not claiming to be an expert on this. I'm just claiming to be somebody that's basically stayed up for the last three days and read a huge amount of scientific literature. That doesn't make me an expert in any way. Striction, lateral losses. Yeah.